Welcome to All Things Food. Uh, this is going to be a really exciting week uh, for this beautiful food that we're going to discuss today. Um, just like every week, uh, remember if you would like to ask a question at the end, uh, please raise your hand or um, uh, write in the chat box in, in Zoom or you can uh, Facebook message um, uh, through Facebook uh, to Carmen Reeves and she will ask the question. So without further ado, let's talk today about the Opuntia cactus, also called prickly pear or nopalis. So right now in the United States in the Northern Hemisphere, these things are coming into season for the fruit. So let me show you. This is an Opuntia cactus pad, also called prickly pear. And the reason it's called prickly pear is because these are the fruits. It doesn't look anything like a pear, but somebody named a pear and it's prickly, so that's it. Uh, I grew up, as you all know, in the desert southwest, and one of my first memories, actually, I was probably three or four years old, and I was out with my great-grandmother harvesting these in the desert because she would make jelly out of these every year. And she'd also eat them, and uh, she would get a little bit of thorns in her lips, and I remember with tweezers removing, because I had, you know, perfect eyesight, and she's an elder woman, so I remember removing these thorns from her lips, and that was one of my first memories. So, um, so this is something that I've been consuming since I was a kid. And uh, it's very, this is a very exciting ingredient. But why don't we go ahead and start with the pad, what people call nopales um, in Mexico and in other um, Latin American countries. Uh, this, this is a, a delicious treat if you know how to process it. Now, if you go to a grocery store that caters to Latinx communities, a lot of times you can already found, find these pre-chopped. And if you're in the Southwest, um, if you go to the grocery store, you'll see ladies just processing these um, to order. So you can walk up and say, you know, I want two pounds and I want them cut in strips or, you know, they'll just slice the spines off so you can grill these whole. Um, this is just a very, very delicious uh, thing to eat. Um, they're really rich in vitamins and minerals. And um, actually, this part is actually best to harvest in the spring um, because they're kind of sweeter, but you can harvest them pretty much year round. These are edible. Um, the one that we have here in the, in the Piedmont of North Carolina is the hardy cactus, the hardy variety of this that can handle um, freezing temperatures. But there are a lot of the Opuntia cacti that don't handle freezing temperatures well, and, um, and those grow in places where it doesn't really freeze ever. Um, you'll see these all over the place as ornamental plants, um, and they're lovely to look at. Uh, make sure if you are gonna plant them, which is actually pretty easy, you just break one of these off, get yourself a pair of tongs, walk around with a double paper bag, and you just walk up and you bend it and break it off. And then if you let this dry for a couple of days, you can just stick this in soil and it will grow. These never get super huge here. They probably only get maybe three feet high here in North Carolina, but in places where it doesn't freeze, like the tropics or the desert, um, these get huge. They can uh, build up to almost a two-story building. Um, they just get massive. Um, and then in storms, sometimes they'll fall over. So you have to be really careful with these. Also, another thing that people do is they'll plant a row of these around the border of their property to keep animals out. A lot of people also plant these underneath their windows because nobody wants to climb into a window with a massive cactus underneath it. So, you know, if you're looking for a little home protection and ornamental beauty and edible beauty in your landscape, you could absolutely grow these under a window. Um, just be careful because you also might have to exit that window in an emergency, but people do use it for that. So um, eating any kind of cactus food, there are lots of edible cacti. Um, it's not just these. There's also like the saguaro cacti that are really, you know, the, with the arms like this, though they're famous in all the, the movies. Um, they actually put off a fruit that's really delicious. Um, these are a great source of water. Uh, all cacti are. So if you're walking through the desert and you don't have water, if you have a knife, you can actually cut into a cactus and squeeze the moisture out of it. Um, there's a lot of edible fruits on cacti in the desert. Um, and we'll actually bring in some of the other edible fruits of cacti in future weeks. Um, you'll be surprised with some of the stuff that you can find in a grocery store. So um, one of the things that you'll notice about, uh, about cacti is that when you slice into them, they'll be, have like a gu gooey mucilaginous um, kind of slippery substance on the inside, very similar to okra. And so you could actually use this in substitution for recipes with okra. That's really easy to do. Um, this one's a little bit mature and thick, 
normally the ones that I would process are the thinner, younger ones like this. Um, you know, they, they get a little bit bigger. It's best to harvest them in the morning because they're less acidic in the morning. Um, but even if they are acidic later in the day, so they're still really delicious. They taste kind of sour. They have like a sour taste. But the gooeyness on the inside are polysaccharides. Those are soluble fibers, and those are very, very healthy for us to eat. They uh, not only keep us regular, but they also feed our gut flora that we're always talking about, our microbiome in our digestive system. Those gooey fibers feed those good bacteria and um, help them to grow and stay healthy. So it's a really healthy thing to eat. Also, if you're eating a lot of soluble fibers, it actually there's a lot of research on it lowering blood cholesterol. Um, it's able to, because of the, the fibers, you're actually able to um, remove oxidized cholesterol from your blood you know, by the blood flowing into you, by your intestines, picking up, you know, exchanging water and nutrients. It will also, if you have a lot of polysaccharides in your gut at the time, it will release oxidized cholesterol to be excreted. So um, that's how, you know, when I was a kid, I always wondered, how does oatmeal lower cholesterol? It's not like you're injecting it, but that's how it works, is that if you eat a lot of soluble fiber, whether it's in the form of some kind of fruits and vegetables or whole grains, um, it gives your digestive system the ability to pull the bad cholesterol, your LDLs, out of your system more efficiently than if you weren't eating as much fiber. So that's why a high fiber diet is actually heart healthy. Um, one uh, word to the wise, if you're gonna start eating cacti, eat it a little bit at a time until your body gets used to it because it's very fibrous. Um, so just start slow and maybe eat it as like a garnish on something and then you can kind of build up over time. You don't wanna go crazy and eat like a whole cup or two of this because you will be very regular. Um, so just, you know, as your body gets used to it and that's pretty much anything with beans, with anything, any food that you don't eat a ton of the first time you try it, eat a little and see how your body reacts. It's just a good rule of thumb. So let me show you how to process one of these. I'm gonna process the big one so you can see it. But again, I would probably harvest one of these thinner kind here. So um, wear a pair of gloves, it's really helpful. And wherever there's a little bump, that's pretty much where spines are gonna be. So first what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut off the end because it's so tough, it's not really edible. Throw that away. And then take your knife and run it around the outside because there's spines all along the edge. So we're just gonna do a little kind of smiley face here and take this off. Ooh, that's a tough one. These are wonderful. They taste a little bit like green beans when you cook them. Um, a great way to cook them is to grill them or if you wanna pan fry them, fry them in a little bit of oil all of this moisture starts to seep out of it, let it seep out and then cook off and you have a perfect delicious nopal. Um, so you can see all the little bumps there. We're gonna just assume that there is a uh, thorn in each one and you're gonna cut those out. And you just do this, go all the way across one after another until they're all cleaned off. And when you do both sides, go ahead and wipe everything down. Give this a good rinse to get all the residual spines off of it. And then you can dry it off and chop it up into either little chunks or strips, big squares. You could go ahead and grill this bad boy whole. You just drop it on the grill, a few minutes each side. Really, really lovely. I especially like these grilled because it gives it like a nice smoky, delicious flavor. So, okay, let's move to the tuna. So this is the prickly pear, but they're also called tunas. Not really sure why, because they're not a fish, but uh, it's a Spanish word, and, um, but that's the name for them. This is my favorite part. Um, these are sweet, but not too sweet. Um, they're really delicious. Uh, another thing is con consuming all cactus foods, but also the prickly pears. Um, they have the ability to regulate your blood sugar. So because there's so much fiber in them, um, it keeps you from spiking your blood sugar when you're eating other foods. So it's really important for people who are diabetic or pre-diabetic. You can get something sweet, but it's really nutritious and keeps you from spiking your blood sugar. So what we're gonna do with this is we're gonna cut off the top and the bottom, like so. And then you're gonna put the big side down and you can actually use a, um, a vegetable peeler for this as well. Um, this process that I'm going through right here, um, you do not have to do unless you're gonna eat this fresh um, or if you wanna cook it. But really, if, if you're trying to make um, like a juice or a jelly, what you do is you take the whole fruit with the spines and all, stick it in a blender or a food processor, 
process it to like a, a liquid, and then you put that liquid in a flour sack towel. This is an a, a example of a flour sack towel. So these towels in my kitchen at home and in our kitchen here at the food lab, um, these are generally lint-free towels. So it's sort of like taking five or six layers of cheesecloth and, uh, and, and weaving them together. So the reason they call these flour sack towels is that back in the day, people used to get big bags of flour in flour sacks, in cloth cotton sacks. And then um, because women back then, you know, they, especially if you're on a pioneer person and you go to the store and you buy this flour, once you use up the flour, you're also gonna sew a dress out of that flour sack. So there's all kinds of pictures of, you know, the olden times where these cute little girls are wearing these dresses made out of a flower sack. They're super cute. So a lot of times um, the flower sacks would actually have like floral prints on them or some kind of pattern so that uh, when you used all the flour, you would have a nice, uh, a nice pattern to make a clothing out of. But anyway, these days we get our flour in paper bags and we have to buy flower sack towels. And these are just great to have in the kitchen. I only use these for food surfaces for food. So if I'm drying a clean dish, I'll use this towel. And if I'm gonna strain like iced coffee or I'm gonna strain this, that's, this is what I use. So that my towels that I use for cleaning are a separate color towel so that I make sure that I don't have any cleaning residue next to my food. Um, so these are really wonderful for straining things. Now, if you are gonna strain uh, cactus stuff through here, it's gonna be a lot of work to clean. You may have to throw away the towel depending on you know, how much time you want to put into it. So again, if you want to make juice out of these, you take them, put them in a blender raw with spines and all, and then you strain it through this, you squeeze, and all the seeds and all the, um, all the spines and everything will stay inside the towel and clean juice will come out. And that juice is worth 60 to $100 a gallon when you buy it preserved, even in the Southwest where these plants are plentiful. So, um, and it, there's a lot of fiber in that juice as well. So um, really, really delicious. It freezes really well. You've never been in the Southwest. I'm sure you've seen the prickly pear margaritas. Those are amazing. Uh, it's, it's sour and sweet and lovely. It's got a very kind of mellow, a little bit of earthy flavor to it, um, but it's got a ton of seeds in it. of a lot of feet, but you know, it's free fruit basically, it's lovely. So those are two of the products that are available from the Opuntia cactus. But there's, you've probably eaten many products from the Opuntia cactus and didn't even know it. So let's talk a little bit about cochineal. So this is a picture of a prickly pear cactus pad. And those white spider looking webs there are a sticky little kind of uh, protective barrier for a scale insect called cochineal. And this is a picture of that insect. So it's a true bug, which means that it inserts um, like a proboscis into uh, a plant and they suck the plant juices out. They don't chew, they, um, they and those are called true bugs when they sort of um, remove juices either, you know, from whatever prey or food that they're consuming. So um, if this is called cochineal and you see how it's red like this. Well, what they do is they, they harvest um, this sticky white stuff here. And in fact, if you pick up some of this sticky white stuff and you rub it between your fingers, it will turn bright red. So, um, so this little insect, you can make this pigment out of that insect. So this is why if you eat certain red dyes, your food isn't vegan. Um, so vegans are aware of this ingredient because um, we use it in food products. If you've ever been to Starbucks and you had one of their strawberry frappuccinos, you're drinking it. If you wear red lipstick, most likely you're wearing it. Um, you, they, it's used to dye clothes. In fact, it attaches very, very well to wool material. And um, because of that, the English redcoats that came over during the Revolutionary War to come over here and like, you know, put all the European, um, you know, um, immigrants, you know, back in line to make this British colonies, uh, actually those red coats, that was cochineal that dyed those wool coats. So this used to be very hard to get in process. And so um, it was the color of royalty. Um, also, um, back in Mexico, back in the day, um, a couple hundred, few hundred years ago, 
silver was the most valuable commodity and export in Mexico, and the second was cochineal. So this was desired around the world, and it was a massive um, export. Um, it still is. So the, actually, though, this has been spread around the world to be um, propagated so that um, they can be inoculated with these cochineal bugs and make the red dye. So if you want to know if you have cochineal, so this is how you spell that, cochineal, if your ingredient list says cochineal or carmine red, um, then it has this puree in it. This, this powder in it. Um, also, if you see on the ingredient list, carmine extract or natural red number four. So I know a few of you are probably thinking, ew, I'm eating bugs, ew. But the truth is we eat bugs all the time. So um, I have a niece who's vegan and I love her. I love all people's food choices, however they wanna live their lives. I'm just here to educate you about it. I'm not here to yuck anybody's yum. Um, but she was a little disappointed in this and I said, honey, it's okay. You eat a lot of vegetables, you eat bugs all the time. Like you just do. If you eat fresh fruits and vegetables, there's gonna be a bug in there somewhere. Our packaged foods, there's actually an allowable amount of bugs in packaged foods, everything from baby food to crackers to cereal, you name it. So I don't mean to scare you, but we really do eat bugs all the time. So also this is an extract. Um, it's not actually like the whole bug. So just keep that in mind. But, um, but this is a safe pigment that comes from this little guy. Um, there are quite a few of the red pigments, the ones that are generated from um, coal tar and you know, like the FDNC red number fill in the blank. Um, there's a lot of those actually that have been found to be carcinogenic. So they're not actually in um, in foods anymore, because if you consumed in large amounts, um, they've been found to cause cancer in, uh, in animals. So um, natural dyes, these, this is safe, it's been consumed for thousands of years, it's generally recognized as safe. It's very, very rare for there to be an allergy to this type of dye. Um, but I think it's just a surprise to a lot of people to know that, you know, it's not just wool, it's not it, but it's drinks, it's, you know, sports drinks, candies. Um, we consume this stuff all the time. So kind of surprising, but I think it's super interesting. I think insects are, I mean, that's a whole other talk, but insects are very, very interesting. So that's about all I wanted to say about that. Real quick, before we open it up for questions, let's talk about the chili of the week. Okay, the chili of the week is the New Mex Joe. So there's actually a Chile University at the State University of New Mexico. Uh, let's see, is it USNM or something? Anyway, um, the State University of New Mexico has been uh, breeding and developing chilies since the mid 1800s. And they have developed lots of varieties of chilies. They have actually even um, influenced the uh, cuisine of New Mexico. So people think Mexican food, that it's just this one big, you know, this, it's a one thing with tacos and a certain kind of cheese. And that is not true. Mexican food is highly regional, just like American food is highly regional. You're not going to find collard greens cooked with, you know, um, like a ham hock in the Southwest or in the Northwest. You're going to find that in the Southeast. There's all kinds of regions. You're not going to find like maple sugar candy everywhere. You're going to find it in Vermont. Um, you know, lobsters for a few bucks a pound, that's Maine. These are all regional cuisines. Mexico is the same. So, um, but one of the American versions of Mexican food um, influenced is New Mexican cuisine. And the green chili has everything to do with that. If you go into any restaurant there, you're going to be able to find green chili pork or green chili beef, red chili beef, red chili chicken, and they can be made from the same chili but one of them is harvested unripe and one is harvested ripe. So this particular chili, the New Mex Joe, Joe E. Parker, um, it's because there's a graduate of, uh, of the Chile University and he actually developed this pepper. Um, it's very similar to an Anaheim chili. You know, if you go to like any grocery store and you buy a green chili that looks long and thin like this, um, it's considered an Anaheim or an Anaheim type. This is an Anaheim type chili, but when you cut into this, the walls are really thick. So um, the walls are a lot thicker, so they're better for roasting. If you have a very 
thin pepper, like a, it's a, it's a thin bodied pepper and you try to roast it, you may end up totally dehydrating this uh, flesh in here and you don't have anything left to peel off. So um, they developed this one as excellent for cooking. It's about a third to a half as spicy as a jalapeno. And the reason that they were actually, this is one of the reasons they developed this is that they wanted to develop a chili that would have a regular amount of spice. You know, sometimes you get a jalapeno and it'll blow your hair back and other times you'll get one and it almost has no spice at all. They wanted to develop this pepper so that it would be consistently the same spice as much as possible um, pe pepper plant to pepper plant. Um, however, if pepper plants are stressed, if you put them under stress, they will actually create more caps capsaicin, the stuff that makes things spicy. So this is an excellent pepper for stuffing. If you've never roasted a pepper before, you're missing out. So if you have a gas stove or a grill with an open flame, it's the easiest. You just lay it on an open flame until the skin blackens and then you throw this in a bowl that's covered with a plate or um, you can throw it in a paper bag or a plastic bag wherever it can steam for a little bit and this hard outer uh, skin will separate from the flesh inside so uh, you do that to however many peppers i have so many peppers right now i'm roasting constantly um, and then you set these down take a little like a, a knife and you just peel off the outside and then you split it down the middle like this, and it's really easy to peel open and you just cut out the seeds on the inside. Now you can stuff it with rice and beans, or you can stuff it with seafood, you can stuff it with anything you want pretty much and put a little cheese on top. This is a great thing if you pre-stuff them and then you lay them out in a baking pan, like a Pyrex or something um, with a lid um, and you sprinkle cheese on top, you can, put the cover on and stick it in the freezer and it'll be good for like six months to a year. It's nice to have around in case, you know, if you've got a big family and you're harvesting a lot of peppers, if you're going to do it you, and you're going to set it all up to roast all these, you might as well make twice as much and freeze them. And then you have this like gourmet, beautiful meal that you didn't have to put any effort in the night that you actually wanted to eat it. So I do that a lot. I roast a lot of peppers at one time because now is the time of year that they are just kicking off like nobody's business. So I'm roasting peppers almost every night. It's crazy. If you have an electric stove, what you can do is turn your broiler on and that's usually on the top in an electric stove and put the rack closest to, to the broiler and then you line these up on a baking sheet shove them under the broiler wait a few minutes pull them out and if they're blackened on one side you flip them over and you blacken them on the other side and then you can dump those all in a bag cover them up and let them steam for at least five if not ten minutes i bet you're saying Sherilyn, what if I don't have that kind of time? Okay, so what you can do is split it up over a couple of nights. I've found that if I'm busy and I just wanna roast some peppers to you know, start to get them done, once they're blackened and I don't have time to peel them and mess with them, you can actually pop them in the fridge overnight or for even for a couple of days and peel them a couple of days later and clean them up and, and get them ready to store. Um, if you don't feel like making stuffed peppers out of them, you can actually just, um, uh, you can actually just freeze them in bags or freeze them in little containers and they're great. They're a great ingredient to add to things last minute, you know, a fresh element. If you have some that are already chopped up, you can add them to soups, stews, salads, uh, frittatas, you know, omelets, things like that. They're a nice like ingredient that you can add, um, you know, from your garden. If you are going to stuff the peppers, I recommend leaving the stem on because it's really beautiful. Um, Chili rellenos, rellenos means stuffed. So if you've ever had a chili relleno, that's where they split these. They'll dip this in an egg batter when it's stuffed with cheese and they fry it and then they serve it to you. And it's so amazing to like bite into the batter and it's got this like long stringy Oaxaca cheese or you can have like a uh, meat or anything in there. So a very versatile food, really wonderful. Check out Chili University, it's really neat. Um, and if anybody wants to stop by Briggs and look at our crazy peppers, there's probably like 22 more to go. This one actually I got in my backyard, but there's so many different peppers. I may have to start doing two a week because there's a lot. So, okay, let's open it up for questions. Awesome. Um, I really am glad we do this after lunch instead of before lunch. <laughs> um, so our first question um, is where you can buy those um, flower bag towels that you were showing us. Oh my gosh. Walmart, Target, uh, like anywhere you go to the kitchen section, your local grocery store a lot of times will have them. I buy them in a five pack. Never pay more than like a dollar for these though. Somebody's, you know, the, they have really cute ones that have, sometimes my husband will bring me home 
um, like ones that have funny sayings, you know, like kitschy kind of cutesy things. Those are flower sack towels too, but those are the ones that you buy for gifts that are $14 a piece. But these little plain ones like this, you know, you can get them anywhere. Just go to the area where they sell the regular towels and look near the bottom. And they're usually in packs of five or 10. That's how I buy them. You can also buy them online. They're easy to get, but make sure they're hundred percent cotton and you're good to go. Awesome. Um, so I have a couple from Facebook. Um, can you grow cactus year round here in North Carolina? Yeah. You, you mean grow it? Yes, absolutely. This particular variety, you can. We don't have the diversity of Apuntia here that they do in other places where it doesn't get cold. Um, but uh, you can grow this particular variety. So um, it's definitely worth it. You can buy the plants, but really if you just find a friend or, you know, there's a lot of times like parking lots where they're being used as like just, you know, landscaping and you just pluck off a couple of them and you can actually just stick them in the ground. But they like to be high and dry. Don't let them get too wet. Um, and oh, also in the spring, the flowers, ugh. I mean, do a web search for the flowers of these things. They are gorgeous. Beautiful, beautiful flowers, super low maintenance. You just stick it in the ground and like, you know, maybe, in, you know, you can plant them year round and you can grow them year round and you have to water them when they're first getting established. If they're in a pot, you have to water them more often. But once they get established, you don't do anything but harvest from them or look at them. They're, they're like the most low maintenance plant. You just gotta be careful not to put them near walkways because um, one of the things to notice is that some of these, are um, these hard spines, which will hurt a lot if they hit you. But the ones that are the most annoying are these little hairy spines right there. Those ones, you get on you and you're like, where is it? You can feel it pricking you and they're really hard to find. So as long as you're just careful, you'll be totally fine. Um, but just put them in an area where people, it isn't a thoroughfare or something like that, like up against a wall or something where they're not gonna be um, walked into. Where I got these actually, because in the South, for some reason, nobody uses their front door. They use like their side door or their driveway door, always. It's a weird thing. Also, not that many people have fences. I don't know why, but it's a cultural thing. So um, <laughs> the walkway to go up to this lady's house where I found these, it was a total stranger. I knocked on her door and asked, please, if I could have them. Um, and she was wonderful and lovely and let me have them. But you had to walk through them. There was like a walkway. Because when you don't know someone, you don't knock on their side door. That's how they know that you're an unfamiliar person. You knock on the front door. But I had, it was like running the gauntlet to go through these two mats of cacti on either side of this walkway. Not a good place for cactus, but I took enough of them away that nobody's going to hurt themselves, at least not for another year until it regenerates itself. So. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I wanted to see if any of our audience members wanted to say, ask a question in our last couple of minutes. Otherwise, I'm going to ask my question. Okay, so my question, this is actually for, from Carmen and I. We're wondering what your favorite recipe to use the nopal is. Oh, okay. Well, there's a lot, but there's one that I really, really enjoy and that I make for my family, um, especially when people are unfamiliar with this. It's really great to put it in a salsa. So what I do, like a corn salsa, so if you take these and you grill them, um, they get like kind of a little bit of a blackening and smokiness to them. And then you cut them really small and you can serve it as like a salad, like it's cactus. Oh, I also do the corn like that. I take the whole corn and you can either uh, soak the husk and grill the corn with the husk on. But I usually just peel the husk off because I want that little blackened flavor and I oil it a little and then I put it on the grill and blacken the corn a little bit. And then fresh, it's a summer meal for sure because it's like fresh summer tomatoes from the garden. Um, a little bit of basil, or you can buy cilantro because when basil is growing here, cilantro is out of season. I love cilantro in there. And um, a little bit of lime zest and juice is fantastic, or lemon if you got it, um, or a touch of vinegar if you have it. But, you know, with citrus in the world, like I don't really use vinegar that often. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much it. It's a really simple thing. If you want to serve it as a salad, crush a little fresh like queso fresco over the top. It's like a fresh farmer's cheese um, from Mexico. Um, but you can also use like just like feta or, you know, even fresh mozzarella might be fun. I don't know. It's a little bit of a fusion meal at that point. But, um, but you know, give it a try. So, and then you serve it and people eat it and they're like, wow, what is this? And you're like, oh, actually it's a cactus salad. People are really interested in it. So, and it's fun to do kind of thematic meals with this stuff where you use this ingredient and like, you know, you might make the salad with that, but then you make like a prickly pear sorbet for, um, for dessert. Prickly pear sorbet is really good. Sounds really good. Um, before we close, could you spell the name of the cactus again for us? Yes. 
For my visual learners. Yes. <laughs> it's Opuntia, O-P-U-N-T-I-A. Great, thank yeah. you. Awesome. Well, I think we are out of time and out of questions, so we will end, but thank you so much, Sherilyn. You're welcome. See you next week, everybody. Bye. Bye.